religions have often been criticized because of their tendency to a non-aggressive attitude. While this does not necessarily reflect their policy, it certainly does reflect their teachings in many cases. Religions have always emphasized the importance of acceptances. In the older theological systems, the will of God was regarded as final authority. Man could not go against this. And although he might sometimes rebel inwardly against the conditions that arose in his life, he could only accept whatever heaven sent. The Chinese had their own adage bearing upon this, in which they expressed the concept that heaven bestows and man receives. What man receives, he must take. What heaven wills, he must do. Actually, there is a certain rather valuable psychological principle involved in this concept. We have to recognize that most rebellion is essentially meaningless. It is merely an emotional outburst, an intensity, an anger, a resentment, some form of opposition arising in man, causing him to have a very negative reaction to the things that occur around him. If the individual has been trained from early life to certain disciplines of acceptance, there is no doubt that his worldly affairs will go more pleasantly for him. For the, in the first place, religion has a tendency to blunt rebellion at its very source. Uh, the person finds no advantage in attempting to resist the will of heaven, whatever this may demand. He has also been brought up in a code, and this code has imposed certain disciplines upon his own attitudes. If he is devout, he has been trained not to hate. If he is sincere, he has been indoctrinated with certain standards of honesty. If he considers himself an upright citizen in the face of heaven and earth, he maintains his honor, protecting it to the very best of his ability. Thus, he has a tendency to defend himself against temptation, even as the temptation itself arises. He does not wait until it has taken a firm hold upon him. I know I have talked to a great many very devout individuals. Some of them perhaps were a little narrow-minded, a little bigoted. But one quality was rather clearly indicated. What their credo taught, they obeyed. If their doctrine told them that they should not cheat, they did not cheat. Nor did they have a great struggle with themselves to decide where the advantage of dishonesty might lie. They did not allow a long pattern of negative factors to take hold of them, to gradually indoctrinate the individual with arrogance or sophistication or open antagonism. I know that in the old days, when life was not as pleasant, perhaps, as it is now, many individuals guided their entire span of earthly life by a code, by a simple belief. They held to this as firmly as they could. They made mistakes, that is obvious. But all in all, they did save themselves a tremendous amount of misery. I know the, in the community where I lived, 
one rather kindly, placid-faced old lady was more or less a tradition even while she was alive. Her face was without any of the marks of tension which we observe so often now. She was regarded as a good woman. Good because she had a simple code and a simple creed and she lived it. Her code taught her to be charitable so she shared her goods with others. Her code taught her to be humble so she carefully avoided the pitfalls of pride. Her code told her to live simply and she followed it to the letter. She refrained from many luxuries that others enjoyed because her creed did not approve of luxuries. And when difficulties arose, she retired quietly into prayer, asking for strength and understanding and insight. And then whatever happened was the will of God. And she accepted it with tears sometimes, but with a deep inner belief that what happened was right. Now it is obvious that this type of defense mechanism, if you want to call it that, does have a tendency uh, to simplify and direct living. In Eastern philosophy, in Buddhism for example, Buddha himself made a strong point of the importance of watching the pressures that arise within us. At the first sign of some undesirable characteristic, we must transmute this. We must never allow small evils to grow up and become great evils. We must never allow a tendency to finally take such hold upon us that we can no longer control it. So in the Buddhist doctrine, the moment an, an attitude that was inconsistent with true value arose within the mind or emotions, it was the duty of the person to quietly but firmly reject this attitude. Build nothing upon it. Allow it no place in his life and turn from it even while the first pressures were forming within himself. By this constant vigilance, the person never permitted himself to become habit-ridden. He never allowed antagonisms or hatreds or jealousies to go on until they possessed him. So we have the question that the Buddhist of old asked, Who am I? And the old answer to this was, I am simply the sum of my own pressures. I am the consequence of a dominant attitude that has taken hold of me. And this attitude has gradually become the administrator. It has come to use all subservient attitudes to attain its own purposes, so that actually the person is a psychic drive demanding the fulfillment of its own objectives. As this drive becomes more and more powerful and intense, the individual becomes increasingly ruthless. As the drive becomes an obsession, he is willing to sacrifice the good of others, the happiness of his family, and the well-being of his own nature, simply to fulfill this drive. Some objective has become an obsession, and under this obsession, the quietudes, the acceptances, are left behind, ignored, until at last the person becomes so set in his false opinions that even the most skillful therapist may have great difficulty in relieving him of the burden of attitudes which have, gra which have gradually taken over all of his thinking and living. Against this, of course, must come the less strenuous, the less personal, the less egocentric uh, qualities which we have associate with acceptances. 
Let us look around us a little bit in life as we see it now to find out what is the difference between an acceptance and a negative attitude. Uh, to assume that everything is as, is as we would like it to be would be a very negative attitude. To accept everything as it is, as fully right or complete or acceptable finally, might also be a rather unfortunate conclusion. But to accept the thing as we find it now, as the proper state in the unfoldment of something better, to recognize this transitoriness of the condition as it is, to realize that what we now face is the consequence of right destiny. It is what we have earned. We are in the condition we have earned for ourselves. We are faced by the problems we have not solved, and we are sustained by the wisdom that we have accumulated out of the past and out of previous lessons that have been learned. Consequently, acceptance begins by acknowledging that every challenge is a lesson, and every lesson is a challenge to insight. That the true solution lies in the skillful use of insight. That we must solve these issues and matters within our own natures before they have a time or condition or opportunity to pass out of our control. If therefore we find temper arising, we also know, if we are thoughtful persons, that we can control that temper. Another point to bear in mind is that everyone, unless he be feeble-minded, is perfectly aware of the basic principles of right and wrong. This dazed excuse that we do not know is at best applicable only to the most complicated situations. The individual who has been raised in any kind of an orderly atmosphere, who has any principles within himself, who has any faith in values whatsoever, and even though he be a materialist, has any consideration for the public good, will know the temper will gain nothing of value. The individual using temperament in an emergency is simply exhausting his own resources. Every explosion of disposition is an enervating thing. Now, modern psychologists take the ground that we need to get rid of these pressures. That therefore, when we feel like exploding, we had better explode. Uh, there is very little real common sense in this attitude. And to try to treat with psychotherapy the perpetual exploder is an almost useless task. Actually, we can liken the pressure of temperament to the pressure of steam in a boiler. Certainly, there is a safety valve on this boiler. And we can, under certain conditions, open this valve and let off steam. We then close the valve, go back to some other occupation, and a little later we must come back, open the valve again, and let off more steam. The reason being that all the time uh, steam is being generated by the fire under the boiler. If you want to prevent this steam pressure from rising beyond a reasonable degree, you have got to lower the fire under the boiler. You have nothing to gain by constantly letting off steam and then creating more. Uh, the idea that we will finally get rid of all the steam and settle down to be quiet people is more or less ridiculous. And the only reason we do not realize how foolish this attitude is, that somewhere along the individual drops dead letting off steam. So we never know what he might have done, and he exhausted all of it. It exhausts him first. It is obvious, then, that the 
attitude of acceptances is reducing the pressure behind the personality. Therefore, the personality will not build up pressure. It will not build up this steam which must be constantly released by some artificial procedure. If we do not build up tension, we will not need to take sedation to control tension. We will not find it necessary to block intensities by various bromides if we do not create the tension. All tensions have a destructive effect finally upon some part of our compound natures. They damage structure. They impair function. They establish the, big, the bases for physical and nervous and emotional ailments. They make us sick, slowly but surely. Now some insist that this is true but, but only to the degree where these tensions and pressures uh, are, we will say, not justified. We always like to hold the attitude that we have the right to be righteously indignant. And there are certainly cases where an individual has a tremendous provocation for being angry. There is no doubt that when we have been bitterly imposed upon, deceived, or injured, where it is obvious that others have victimized us knowingly and intentionally, uh, we look rather helplessly about and say, are we supposed to take this? Are we supposed to be happy, lovable creatures in the presence of very serious wrongs that have been done to us? Is it not perfectly justifiable for us to finally turn and injure the person who has injured us? It is only justice. He has had his day, and now it is our turn to have ours. He has hurt us without consideration. Why should we consider him? He has cheated us. Why should we not cheat him? And with situations as they are, why not cheat him before he has a chance to cheat us? Always assuming that in this particular kind of life that we know, uh, the rule is uh, to impose upon the other person first. Actually, nature recognizes no difference between righteous and unrighteous indignation inasmuch as it recognizes no difference between uh, processes or situations or trends which are essentially the same in principle and are only subject to different interpretations. Uh, our blood s uh, pressure is not any improved because our indignation is righteous. The damage we do to ourselves is not less because we justify it. Whenever we permit our emotions or our attitudes to become destructive, we are hurting ourselves regardless of the motivations. This is undoubtedly one of the reasons why we find the strong emphasis in the New Testament on the problem of forgiving the adversary. If we do good to those who do good to us, what merit or credit have we? For so, so do the scribes and Pharisees. If we, therefore, are injured and turn about and injure the person who hurt us, we have only joined our natures with those of millions of other ignorant people who are not aware that their course of procedure is going to lead to further misery for themselves. In the law of causality, the evil that has been done by another returns to him. The evil that we do returns to us. And if we do an evil in a way of spiting him, this evil that we do is still our own. We have set in motion 
a cause of further suffering for ourselves regardless of the provocation. The provocation does not change uh, the reaction of the situation. Nature does not wish anyone to injure anything. And no amount of injury by one justifies injury by another. It is obvious that this is a very difficult p policy to maintain. It seems that almost instinctively we rise against uh, an injury. We believe subconsciously in the, uh, on the old idea of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And when someone hits us, we want to strike back. And because we have been hit, and because we have struck back, and this has been the policy of mankind since the beginning of history, this is the reason why we have nuclear fission today. Because there is no end to this process of avengement and revengement. And uh, today we are hearing people talking of ills done 300 years ago that must be righted, of mistakes that were made 500 years ago that must be paid for, and uh, wrong notions that have been carried since the dawn of society uh, which must bring their harvest of immediate pain and suffering. So wherever we are, whatever the principle may be, uh, the only possible answer to any injury that is done us is to take an attitude of some kind that causes no further injury to anything or to anyone. Otherwise, injuries will pyramid, and what may start as a small disagreement ends in a lifetime feud. And even this may not exhaust it, for feuds will go down in families from three to five generations, because no one has had the courage or the wisdom to break the tragic chain of circumstances. This is contrary to human nature, we can say that it is almost more than we can ask of a person to graciously and quietly accept injury. Yet this is the only way we can outwit the cycle of causality. This further brings to mind another very solid philosophic principle. When injured, Instead of turning against the other person, turn into ourselves and ask the question, why? Instead of assuming that the injury is completely the responsibility of the person who perhaps became its principal catalyzing agent, let us see just how and why this injury came about. One of the most common causes of injury is some injustice of our own, which has awakened a negative reaction in someone else. The individual who by nature is just, who by consciousness is kind, and who by thought is intelligent, and who by emotion is constructive, such an individual is not nearly so likely to be injured. First, he does not open himself to injury. He is not thoughtless or careless, nor does he set up causes in himself which others will naturally resent. Nearly always, injuries arise from a mutual situation of some kind. In the defense of our own attitudes, we are disrespectful or inconsiderate of other people and they turn on us. Perhaps one reason that we are proverbially injured is because we have lowered our defenses in the hope that we would injure someone else first. This takes us back to principles of Western boxing and Eastern judo. Whenever we are 
off balance whenever we are reaching out to impose upon someone else we are vulnerable this other person can so to say beat us to the punch and this happens a great many times if we are trying to make an unreasonable profit we will stand to take an unreasonable loss if we are selfish indifferent to the rights of others we open ourselves to their antagonisms and wherever we get into trouble wherever we are the victim of something to what degree have we contributed to the delinquencies of the other persons this can be a very sobering line of research and can frequently prove to us that either through carelessness or indifference or selfishness or egotism or simple blindness we have laid the foundation for the trouble that has come to us thus it is not usually true that a noble wonderful thoughtless person is bitterly used it is nearly always true that we are contributing in varying degrees all of us to a pattern of discomforts a pattern of misunderstandings i know we have had a good many cases recently of interreligious marriages that have pointed out some of these problems young soldier stationed in a foreign country has come home with a foreign bride his family is terribly upset uh, they have never stopped to consider that the fair thing to do would be to wait and see what kind of a person their son has married but because this girl happened to come from the balkans or from the near east or the far east uh, no other consideration prevailed it was simply a matter of extraordinary prejudice when the girl arrived she may have been also under a great deal of tension she had subconsciously perhaps some realization that she might not be accepted perhaps her husband has pointed out this danger to her she comes not at her best but inclined to be reticent and defensive this is immediately misinterpreted by persons who wanted to misinterpret it they are just as reticent as she is but their reticence is a noble doubt her is an unreasonable one so these persons come together with a built-in danger of further trouble everything that happens will be interpreted in the worst possible way because the parents have only one basic motive they want to break up the marriage now these parents will be very indignant and very um hurt if for instance the young wife turns on them some day and gives them a piece of her mind to them their motives are above question their their ideals cannot be doubted they are only trying to save their boy from a terrible catastrophe according to their thinking but in reality as some cases have proven they are leading their boy into the greatest tragedy of his life so uh, these the parents would not allow for a moment that their indignation was unrighteous they were very righteous they knew best they were right about everything they were right except they were never for one moment honest they were right except they condemned without hearing they were right because underneath all of their thinking was a conspiracy which was not right and which had a wrong motive perhaps without realization that it was wrong but nevertheless a very cruel and destructive one when people with this kind of subjective patterning are hurt they are very terribly upset about it they just cannot think things through to realize their own part in the pattern 
So wherever we find ourselves suddenly the victims of what appear to be uh, evil intentions of other people, we must give a little question as to what our own motives actually were. Sometimes these motives are perfectly acceptable socially. They are the motives that our ancestors used. They are the motives that our associates are addicted to. But these motives may still be extremely wrong as far as universal principles may be concerned. The only real answer, for instance, to this uh, problem of the foreign marriage that I referred to is another example which occurred in Texas, which I happened to be very close to and saw it work out. Uh, the young son came back with a foreign bride uh, of a very foreign background. The family was a little dismayed. They had been forewarned. They didn't know exactly what to do about it. But they sat down and they made a simple decision. We're going to wait. We're going to come to no attitude until we find out what kind of a person our boy married. If he has married a fine person, we're going to accept her. And we're going to accept her without question. If, he has the, if she has the power to make him happy, we're for her. Well, again, the young lady appeared uh, with uh, reservations, but with a great deal of innate charm and grace and insight and maturity, and a few months was the most beloved member of the family. They had waited for the facts. The facts justified an acceptance rather than a rejection. But if they had made up their minds beforehand or trusted to their gossiping neighbors for a decision, it would have been a very bad situation. So many situations that seem to get pretty difficult must not be blamed upon the other person totally. We are all to blame unless we all use the deepest integrities that we possess. Now if you had asked any of these gossiping neighbors what their motives were, uh, they would have tried their best to justify themselves. All they wanted to do was be helpful. Uh, really, they did not want to be helpful. They knew just as well as anyone else can know that gossiping isn't good. But against the fact that what they were doing was wrong, there was a certain satisfaction that they were exercising an influence, that they were forcing a situation that they were throwing weight around in some way, that they were becoming important because they were helping to advance a negative conspiracy. These people, any one of them, under a polygraph, lie detector, would have admitted that they were wrong. But under ordinary analysis, they would not admit it. They knew in principle they were wrong. But in this particular case, their action was justified. So we have to begin to think through in nature that principles are either always true or they are not true at all. Principles that can be adapted to our moods have not much strength in them. Principles that can be twisted and turned according to denominational beliefs. Principles that apply to one race and not to another. Principles that apply to one level of society and not to another. These are not principles at all. They are merely prejudices and conceits and bigotries. For we live in a universe in which there are certain things that are right and certain things that are wrong. We find out what is right not by recourse to the words of the wise or to ancient scriptures. We find out what is right in terms of what hurts and what does not hurt. Wherever we get ourselves on the wrong side of a situation, we begin to suffer. And we continue to suffer until we correct ourselves. Now, this suffering is sometimes uh, protracted. It does not immediately appear. 
Sometimes it extends as a nagging situation over a period of years. But the person who breaks the rule has to live with the punishment that is inevitable. So philosophy has developed around what we might call a doctrine of experience. That which has never worked probably never will. That which has hurt everyone else will hurt us. That which no one else has ever succeeded in doing well, as far as temperamental problems are concerned, will be difficult for us to do well. But we also realize that out of experience, man has created a code that was first unwritten and finally uh, was recorded uh, for the benefit of ages to come. This code is nothing but the record of the results of long living. The results of cause and effect recorded in the lives of living things. These laws are unchanging. Man must adapt to them. They will never compromise themselves for his sake. Today we are living in a civilization, so-called or alleged, which is a confirmed lawbreaker. A civilization which seems to exist primarily to try to disprove law. A civilization that makes the attitudes or whims of the individual utterly dominant. We are expected to believe that man can live as he pleases, regardless of the level of insight upon which he functions and that no consequence will come to him that is adverse to his own desires. We cannot prove this. We talk about religious superstitions, that it is very difficult to prove the existence of the devil, that it is very difficult to localize the true place in the universe occupied by heaven, that it is also very hard to justify some of the abstractions of theology. Therefore, what we cannot prove, we have a right to reject. But on the side of experience, where things work out, our attitude is, what we have proved, we have a right to reject. We have proved for ages that war will never produce peace. Yet this proof is to be rejected. The individual that believes the good man may go to heaven is superstitious. But the individual who believes that he can win a war and gain security and power for himself and his descendants by autocracy or dictatorship, this individual has a right to affirm that he is realistic. Although he cannot prove anywhere, any time in history, where his kind have not come to a bad end. So nature has bestowed upon us, as many Eastern philosophers particularly have pointed out, an absolute measuring rod. A measuring rod to determine the effects of conduct and that we should be forever mindful of the evidence that accumulates. That this evidence cannot be gainsaid. It cannot be denied, contradicted, or disproven. It can only be hopefully ignored. Evidence tells us that if we want to be reasonable, if we want to think straight, if we want to plan intelligently, if we really have some desire for happiness, for security in life, for genuine friendship, for true and honest affection, if any of these are meaningful in any way, we must live in a manner that will make them possible. And if we do not live in this way, we will not have them, nor can any amount of bribery or chicanery attain them for us. No amount of rejection intellectually of that which is true 
or the effort to build up and prove that which is not true will have any effect whatsoever upon facts. We live in a universe of facts. If we abide by them, they will give us uh, the results that we are entitled to. There is just no way of changing this pattern. And the simplest thing is to change ourselves into harmony with it. We all know that hasty judgment is apt to be bad. We all know that carelessness increases industrial accidents. We also realize that persons who are over-fatigued and drive a car are apt to have accidents. Furthermore, that an individual who has taken too much alcohol and gone out and driven a car is apt to kill himself and other people. He may insist on his right to drink, but whether he is right or wrong in his determination, he is still a menace to himself and others. His own attitudes on the matter have no bearing upon the reality. The reality is how much alcohol is there in his system. And if it is there, it is there. And no amount of platitude can change it. Everywhere, these facts have to be taken into consideration. Most people who make wrong decisions do so because they lack inner integration. Man has to possess a certain intuitive power in order to make successful judgments. This does not mean that he has to have some kind of metaphysical abilities, but it simply means that he must be able to use his faculties as nature intended him to. That he must have these faculties trained to a reasonable degree of efficiency. And that in all emergencies, his wisest course is to make full use of all of the available resources of his mental, emotional, and physical natures. A crisis simply is a demand upon everything that we are to meet the emergency that we face. To meet an emergency with everything that is the best of ourselves, we have to meet it with an extraordinary quietude. We see nature stepping in and setting this pattern in motion. I have gone through a number of tragic circumstances with other people. And nearly always, as an emergency becomes more critical, the natural tendency of the normal person is to become quiet. Over small matters, we may become hysterical. But in the presence of a great uh, circumstance in life, a great tragedy, a great mystery confronting us in life, almost always we become quiet. We become quiet because we instinctively have need of the most of our own nature that we can bring to bear upon this circumstance. We need clarity. We need depth. We need to use thought for solution, for comfort, for consolation, for inspiration, for acceptance. And nature tries to make this thought available to us. Nature also, under normal conditions, builds up a tremendous reserve of quietude for persons carrying a very heavy load. Very often we are able and sufficient to tremendous emergencies. It is after the emergency passes or after the situation is terminated that we may frequently come into a critical emotional condition. Uh, the sudden removal of responsibility, the sudden shift of the pattern, may release a great deal of hysteria or tension. But during the need, we were strong as nature intended us to be. If our insight had been as great as our strength, we would not have had the shock 
uh, reactions afterwards. It just meant that uh, we were using natural resources to get through the emergency. But when it was passed, we fell back again into our artificial attitudes, and these gave way and let us down. Acceptance, then, is actually not the individual who agrees with something he does not believe in, does not compromise in any way his own integrities. Acceptance is clear thinking and a quiet decision made within the self. We do not need to cooperate with anything that we believe to be wrong. On the other hand, in matters where our own judgment may be no better than anyone else's, there is no justification for a bitter outburst of resentment or antagonism. If the person refuses to be tempted into an unreasonable situation, he will not be forced to fight his way out of it. Acceptance, then, is evaluation. It is the proper weighing of situations. It is the effort to discover the true meaning and the real lesson which every incident has for us. It is the person becoming so deeply aware of the importance of principles involved that he is no longer aware of his own feelings primarily. He is only aware that he must sustain values, and that he sustains values with dignity and not with conflict. If we had strong people, we would have very much less of this outburst which we are suffering from today. Very largely, temperamentalism is a symbol of weakness. It is an individual who falling into the water and not knowing how to swim strikes out in every direction at once and sinks. Whereas if he was quiet, he would float and might very well float up on the shore simply carried by the tide itself. But if we thrash around in a situation, the chances are ten to one we will drown. But we will not drown because of the sea but because we did not know how to uh, conduct ourselves in the emergency. Thus, in everything, the cool mind, the thoughtful mind, immediately taking hold of the situation, sees the probabilities and the most likely way out, and quietly and in an orderly manner proceeds to protect values by intelligent judgment, decision, and action. All of these principles are possible only, however, in their operation upon the person having his faculties at his disposal. If his faculties are already tied up in a, t in a tempest, they are not available to him. When he seeks inside himself and finds only prejudices and antagonisms, he is incapable of honest judgment. He has destroyed the right to solve his own problem. He must therefore continue to make the false solutions that have complicated similar problems from the beginning. It is so important, consequently, in a time such as this especially, that individuals try every day to lower pressures, not to lower pressures only in the presence of a major emergency, but to lower pressures continuously, wherever they occur, wherever they arise, even the smallest one, rationalize through it and eliminate it. If you do this for even a short time, the habit of controlling pressure uh, will develop within yourself. This is a form of self-discipline. In the Zen monasteries in Japan, the masters make life utterly miserable for their disciples. Uh, everything possible is done to force the disciples to get out. 
he is not wanted unless he refuses to go. Every object uh, that he turns his attention to brings about some, at least minor, difficulty for himself. He asks a question, and no matter how serious the question, he is going to be ridiculed. If he makes a statement, his ears will be boxed. If it is found that he has a kind of a quiet pride and dignity in himself, he will be appointed to wash the dishes. Anything uh, in him that represents self-will or self-purpose will be relentlessly assailed. Now, this is not done from any cruelty of motive. It is done to force the disciple to make a real evaluation of himself. It is done in order to break down all artificiality, all false pride, and to bring him, temporarily at least, under the complete autocratic domain of the abbot or head of the monastery. The abbot himself has no interest in trying to dominate this young man. He has no interest in trying to injure him. He knows as well as the young man does the sincerity which brought the disciple to the temple. But he knows something else which the disciple does not know. And that is that unless the disciple is able to accept discipline of the most stern kind without the slightest emotional reaction, he will never get very far in his search for truth. Discipline is this first ability of the individual to obey his teacher. But this is only primary. This is the kindergarten grade. The real purpose of this discipline is that the individual shall come to be completely master of himself. That in this mastery there is no force involved. He is not going to browbeat himself. He is simply going to learn to say yes and no, and mean exactly what he says. He is going to lose the word maybe from his vocabulary. Also, he is going to say yes because he has given every possible impartial consideration to the problem. That he will never say yes or no until these simple words represent the fullest degree of insight which he possesses. There will never be a snap judgment. He will derive no judgment from the opinions of another. He will not find his answers by recourse to books. In Zen there are no books. He will speak simply and directly always from the very best of his own understanding and insight. And he will work unceasingly to increase this understanding and insight. And the more simple his life, the more simple his decisions, the clearer his judgment, and the stronger his willingness to do that which is true, with no consideration for his own advantage, as these processes develop in him, his insight strengthens, he becomes more capable of reality and less addicted to error. He has gradually brought himself into harmony with the law governing existence. And this law simply demands that conscious beings bind themselves by conscious effort to the plan to which they belong. Unconscious beings or subconscious beings are bound by instinct. Man must be bound by a conscious dedication and a conscious sacrifice of self-will in order that he may live in harmony with the universal will. Now, it might sound from all this that the end is a pretty dour one. Here an individual goes around psychologically muscle-bound for the rest of his life. He can only do the things that he believes to be right. He must question his every action and his every motive, 
and as one non-member of the sect pointed out, nearly everything that is right is unpleasant, and nearly everything that is pleasant is not right. Therefore, the end is misery. This is not true at all. This has actually no relationship except to the degree of the young novice who gains a hearty fear of his master and his switch and who is constantly in terror of some kind of reproof. It is only after a considerable length of time, perhaps, that the novice gradually gains the great admiration for his teacher. There is the story of the young man who reverently and sedately and with all the formalities approached the master on several different occasions to ask questions, to discuss matters of importance, and to try to convey the impression that he was very serious. Each time the master physically kicked him out and said, don't come around here, I don't even know you. Who are you? And the young novice went out very dejected, built up his ego a little bit, tried to get his self-pride back, went back, tried it again, got kicked out again. This continued until one day something happened in the garden of the monastery, a very wild, strange, wonderful flower blossomed. None had ever seen it before. And the young novice, absolutely possessed by the, the tremendousness of this flower, dashed unannounced into the master's presence and said, Master, come and see this wonderful thing. He was all excited. He forgot himself. He forgot the master. All he could think of was the beauty of this flower. And the master embraced him most tenderly and says, At last, I have met you. I have met the real you. I have met the thing that was not always playing parts, always dressed up, always so demure, always so artificially humble. Forget all this. Simply be yourself. But let yourself be always true, always gracious, always beautiful. Let it have this tremendous thrill at the beauty of this glorious flower. Thus, in the, in the whole concept, there is no real frustration involved. There is no tremendous struggle against temptation because the temptation simply doesn't exist there. The person suddenly comes into a universe of tremendously attractive things. A universe that as far as he is concerned is free of pain. He is aware of the pain of others and is dedicated by his obligations to help others in every way possible. But he is no longer suffering himself from any action of his own. He has compassion for others, pity for others, and a great desire, if necessary, to give his life for them. But it is all a natural acceptance of the right and privilege to sacrifice. In the image she had created because the person failed to live up to it. As soon as she began to realize that this person was not an image of herself, that it was not possible for this person to fulfill her expectations, but that this person could fulfill certain natural expectations and could grow. And being good-hearted would grow. In a little while, the situation became greatly improved, and certain tensions let down, and a certain guidance which this man needed took the place of nagging. And things worked out very much better, and this man is going to become a very stable citizen. He's going to grow. But what was blocking the family was that the wife thought he already knew and was only stubborn. He did not really know. And so we have to watch these things, and only in quietude and in analysis can we discover some of them. 
if we brush along clinging to our own interpretations without thoughtfulness, demanding from others what we expect of them rather than what they can provide, we're going to be hurt. We're going to hurt them and they're going to hurt us. If we gradually develop discrimination, however, we will not expect the unreasonable. We will understand why other people misunderstand us. That it is not merely that they want to hurt us, but that they are not equipped to take on the attitudes that we wish them to take on. Let us also then ask ourselves another question. Do we really know the value of the attitudes we want them to take on? Are we so completely right ourselves that they would be emancipated by becoming like us? Would the fact that they became cut-out copies of our own deportment assure their salvation and our eternal happiness? Usually no. In the first place, the individual who is trying to change others is usually in desperate need of change himself. The patterns which he regards as proper have produced very little for him except trouble. He values them not because they are right, but because they are his. And he assumes that all others can be wrong, but he cannot be. So this statement that we hear so often in a reply to advice, well, if I was in your place, I would do it this way, is utterly meaningless. If the other person was in our place, he would do exactly as we have done, because the place created the situation. We have no reason to assume that anyone would be better by doing it our way, unless we can prove that our way has been astonishingly successful in matters of real value. The mere fact that by our way we have managed to accumulate a few extra dollars or risen a few steps on the social ladder, these things are of no importance to communicate to anyone else. If our way has made us happier, wiser, better people, then perhaps there is some advantage. But if our way has only locked us within a pattern of personal conceits and opinions, it is of no importance even to ourselves. So there is much to be said in favor of not attempting to judge other people's attainments by measuring them against our own. We have tried this policy for ages. And we have discovered gradually, as time went along, that people are quite individual, and that uh, abilities which we feel others need, they may not need as much as we think they do. Perhaps it is better if we can help them also to that degree of quietude in which they can discover their own abilities. Here again, your acceptances are very important. Careers are problems of acceptances. Dr. Schweitzer made a series of acceptances. Abraham Lincoln made a series of acceptances. He knew before he started out the problems that he faced. And there are even records that he anticipated the probability of his own assassination. He accepted responsibilities and chose to carry them and developed around his acceptances a very simple philosophy of life which has made him one of America's greatest citizens. He had no complicated theories, but he did have a clear insight as to duty. He had this courage to do what he believed to be right and he was wonderfully gifted in the simple honesties which enabled him to choose right things 
that were reasonably right. So we find that men of great stature in this world have usually come to their knees and asked the help of heaven and the presence of God and the guidance of truth in all of their undertakings. Great people are nearly always humble, accepting people, seeking always from within themselves some guidance, some clue, some strengthening of conviction to give them the courage to go on and do the things that are necessary. As soon as they become complicated, they become wrong. And that is another point in connection with this situation of acceptances. Errors can become very confusing, very complicated, until the judgment of the wisest will not be a sufficient uh, to divide the false and true. But realities, truths, are very simple, very basic. The individual senses and feels realities, if he permits himself to. He knows by the reaction within himself what is good and what is not good. He gains a certain inner strength when he follows the truth as he knows it. He weakens himself the moment he departs from this conviction. The moment he knows that he compromises his own principles, he has weakened himself. He has lost respect for himself. He has lost faith in himself. Then he turns to all these outside sources of possible support and becomes completely lost in a maze of confusion and conflicting opinions. In philosophy and uh, religion, then, uh, the concept of the retreat was long ago developed. That every year a person should retire for a few days from the turmoil of things to the quietude of self-analysis, the quietude of communion with realities, with unworldliness. Uh, the, uh, the moment that is spent in the presence of that which is truly significant. Today we are hardly able to see the world for the houses. We are hardly able to sense the divine universe because we are hopelessly tied up in subdivisions and building projects. To us today the world is nothing but freeways, tying great centers of industry and commerce together. We have a sense of the importance of the things we do, the importance of the attitudes that we take, and most, impo uh, most important of all, the need for this tremendous ambition drive that will enable us to outwit our competitors. We have to get away from this occasionally, because it is a false world, a completely false one. No matter how we try to prop it up, it is not going to stay in one piece. No matter how we try to support and perpetuate these problems, they fall, they disappear, new patterns arise, and in 50 years practically every notion that we hold today on industry, economics, and politics may be extinct. Certainly it will be outmoded. The only things that will not change are the relationships between man and the essential facts of living. The things that will not change will be the communion with space itself, our relationship to the infinite life within us and around us, and our utter dependency upon universal life for our existence day by day. We will still be dependent upon realities even while we watch the unrealities to which we have dedicated so much time and energy fall to pieces around us. So man must constantly strive to restore a certain orientation in strength, orientation in the quietude of space itself with its vast harmonious patterns of energies, energies that are not fighting and struggling, but are moving majestically through eternity. 
The individual must sense his relationship with eternal life, not merely with a career of a few years and old age pension. Unless he is able to get a separate look at values, he is going to be drowned in false attitudes. If he gets this separate look at values, he can then begin to plan how to handle things which are not so valuable. Once he is free from this entanglement of hypnosis of things, once he no longer accepts his own achievements as superlative and ultimate, once he escapes from the belief that man can be everything and do all, and begins to recognize his true relationships with life, he can relax and he can begin to plan a useful, pleasant life here. When Eastern philosophy moved north and eastward uh, in Asia and set up the uh, great northern schools of yoga, Vedanta, Tantra, Buddhism, a major change took place in the basic psychology of these groups. This change was to the effect that once man has conquered tension in himself, he can adjust to the world and have the advantages of everything that is good in the common way of life around him. It is not necessary that he renounce all worldliness and depart on his lonely journey to the infinite. The only point is that he must have a center. He must have some orientation that is strong enough to prevent him from abusing the immediate material things which surround him. If the person is quietly addicted to value, if he knows in himself something of the reason for his own existence, he may then also accept cheerfully and wisely the realization that he is born into this world, that he is here for a purpose, that he is here to learn more and to work with people in the achievement of a realization of the actual, factual identity of life. It is therefore quite possible for him to make a living, to choose a profession, to become famous or remain obscure according to his own interests. <coughs> he may accumulate all that he needs. He may gain knowledge. He may become a student, a philosopher, or a scholar. He may do almost anything that he wishes to do, from being a simple farmer to being the chief of state. Any situation that arises is within his power and within his pattern as, and within his uh, possibilities as long as he evaluates these things correctly. If he realizes that in terms of value it means absolutely no difference whatever whether he is the farmer or the chief of state. The important thing is to be himself, to live a constructive life. And when he does not care, it is probable that he will make an ideal chief of state, because then he will be incorruptible. He cannot be touched because the things that corrupt most people no longer interest him. He has his core in value. He knows what is valuable. And he will no longer deceive himself, and he will no longer compromise himself, and he can no longer depart from the light that is already within his own consciousness. It is in there. He cannot go against it. So inspired and strengthened by this light, he may live constructively on almost any level of society. He may achieve any reasonable end. And whatever he does do will be done honorably, will be done with a full spirit and a full heart. He will do these things in a way that will bring distinction to his profession or his trade. And he will probably be inspired with a great deal more creative artistry than the person who lacks. 
uh, this inner adjustment. Actually, the person who has achieved this acceptance is the only person who is free. He is free because there is nothing that can enslave him. He has already thoroughly rationalized and intuitively understood through ambition. He has recognized the uselessness of selfishness, that it can produce nothing of value. He has lost all ability to fall back upon hate or jealousy in the justification of himself. He knows his own faults, he knows his own weaknesses, and that efforts to justify them are useless. In substance, he has become honest. And being honest, he is also in a prime relationship with life in terms of growth. Knowing what he does not know, he is open to learning. He knows exactly what he needs to know and will never be obscured by sophistication and assume that he knows more than he does. The test of knowledge is to whether or not it will support him in his emergencies. If the knowledge doesn't work, it isn't knowledge. If the knowledge is only theory and cannot be applied to any particular situation, it is worthless. So the person is continually growing because he knows what he needs to achieve next. Having a completely honest estimation of himself, he can tell exactly the remedies for his own inadequacies. All of this is a very quiet procedure. There is no tendency to appear virtuous. There is no desire to put on airs because they are recognized for their uselessness. Needless to say, such people are hard uh, to injure. The most that we can possibly do is what the tyrant does, destroy their bodies. But these people cannot be destroyed as beings because they will not compromise their principles. The death of the body is a minor situation that can be repaired. Nature has done it often. But the death of honor is a great disaster, very difficult to repair. The individual who compromises his integrities is far worse off than one who suffers martyrdom. So we have to recognize these basic values. Uh, in Christian religion, the acceptance principle is clearly indicated in many of these statements of Jesus, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. Here we are strongly advised never to return evil for evil, never to believe in ourselves as too wise or too knowing, always to remain much as little children in the presence of the majesty of life and reality. Uh, that it is not our purpose or our place to be arrogant, but rather our proper emotion to be forever grateful. Everything that makes up life can bring out of us either constructive reactions or destructive ones. The individual of acceptances is also the person of gratitudes. And we have much in this world to be grateful for, even in times which seem difficult. We have the right to be grateful for the mere fact, perhaps, that we live in a strenuous generation, for it is a generation of great learning. We may see many things fail, but we will never live to actually see truth fail. We will see its forms change, we will see it persecuted and perhaps martyred, but it will rise phoenix-like forever from the ashes of its own dead. Realities can never die, and non-realities can never be preserved. We see around us many inducements 
to turn thoughtfully to our own natures. We observe that never before have there been so many good reasons why we should think straight. Never before has it been more necessary for us to be wise, to be quiet, to be kind. Never before have there been so many demands upon our energies, upon our resources, and upon our strength. These demands require that we shall conserve our resources, that we shall save our energies, that we shall do nothing to uselessly waste any resource that we possess. There is every reason we should be sober and protect ourselves against all such escape mechanisms as alcohol, narcotics, and sedations. If we observe in our own natures that we are not adequate to these conditions and to these pressures, then our first and primary duty is to achieve adequacy. This is far more important than a new swimming pool. This is infinitely more necessary to us than a late model car. And adequacy means more to us in the universe than some passing advancement in our profession or business, which will add to our responsibilities and miseries unless we are big enough to carry these burdens uh, with a right spirit. So no time at all uh, is better than the moment to measure and estimate this term of adequacy in ourselves. Are we tired? Are we nervous, irritable, excited, depressed? Why? It is so easy to say that outside conditions are too much for us. But it is not quite so easy to say that we are too little for our own survival. Well, if man had tried desperately all through time <coughs> to make a noble example of himself, if we knew that people were desperately striving, then we might say it's a terrible thing to have people live so well and have so many troubles. It is hard to believe that people who are so sincere should be in so many difficulties. But we cannot honestly say this. We cannot say that the overwhelming majority of human beings are really, are is really doing the best it can. It is doing the best it feels like doing at the moment. It is doing the best it can without making any improvement upon itself. It is doing the best it can merely to continue as it is. Today we are not finding the average person reacting constructively to the challenge of his own needs. When he finds himself in a serious situation, he seeks to escape only. He does not seek to solve. So humanity gradually divides into two groups. The larger group, which is simply increasingly sorry for itself and a smaller group that beginning to realize the facts is gathering resources to do something about it. And this was the point that Spengler brought out when he noted clearly that the second half of the 20th century would require that the world restores a philosophic foundation for life, that we must move existence from this temporal consideration of advantage to the eternal consideration of, of values, of realities. So the smaller group is trying to get better. The larger group is just taking aspirin, trying to forget that it hurts. The group that is continuing to take aspirin will have its reward. It will probably finally uh, fall into a coma and rest there for a few millennia. But when it does wake up, it will be in exactly the same spot it's in now. Because evasion and the lowering of our ability to react to a stimulation 
does not solve anything. It is the smaller group that coming clearly to realize that it is wrong, that its patterns are not adequate, that its systems are not correct, that the policies which have never succeeded must be changed. This smaller group, finding itself perhaps leaderless, finding its sphere of world influence very limited, and that the great decisions are being made by the irresponsible, is finally confronted with the same decision that every thoughtful person has been faced with since the dawn of big time. He has to start out for himself. He has to assume that the one thing he can do is work himself over and get himself straightened out. Because if he is successful in doing this, he will find a direction for his own efforts and he will also be able to estimate the world condition without simply being angry. The world of the angry men is also totally worthless. If we have the values clearly set, we will be able to recognize integrities and be very grateful that the law does operate, even though it is not always to our satisfaction. The person seeking relief from tension has to make some decision. With 50% of our population neurotic today, and this is a conservative estimate, the higher figures are being presented almost hourly. With this situation, it is obvious that the population cannot depend upon counselors and analysts and psychologists to take care of this enormous group of needy, even if these specialized areas could take care of them. And with the exception of a few violent cases, which have to have psychiatry, uh, the, the, the success of treatment is still a very open matter. For the reason that no matter how hard you work with a situation, you cannot restore something that has actually spoiled itself. So the uh, individual knows that psychotherapy is a long, expensive, and uncertain way of treatment. And that the end of it is likely to be only an adjustment to a situation which is itself wrong and will ultimately prove intolerable again. Some way then, other methods of therapy have to be developed. Religious psychology has come forward in this, not so much, unfortunately, in terms of religion as, as, as in the form of bringing counselors into churches. But religion does have this one great advantage. It has created codes or beliefs which it has implanted in the young. And while some of these may not be entirely desirable, some of these codes, certainly they recommend self-control. That there are standards of right that must be obeyed, and that the child begins to obey them in early life. Religion is the only group today that gives this basic instruction. It is not available in schools, and it is not usually available in homes. And even if it was available in homes, its influence is not sufficiently strong. Whereas if a religious group is well represented in a community and well respected, it has a considerable aura of influence over young people. So if this religious group starts in, with the young child, teaching that child to love God and to be true to his fellow men, to be honest in his dealings, to be kind, to seek truthfulness, to be modest, 
to keep his virtues and in all things uh, to be mindful that he has a destiny in the future a destiny in the universe which he must return to bills that he must pay and that his future depends upon his integrity now if these things can be brought home to the young we have the foundations of self-discipline these teachings are far more, in, uh, far more valuable than any later psychotherapy after the damage is done so we feel that it is very necessary uh, to maintain this religious sphere of influence a religious sphere that is not sectarian that does not make membership in a particular church the outstanding virtue but makes obedience to the laws of God and nature the great virtues if we can maintain these institutions and perhaps gather greater uh, dignity for them uh, by their own broadening and deepening and an increasing fellowship of faiths throughout the world if religions can, dis uh, can overcome their own differences and unite to, to teach a simple, honest, honorable code to the young we will have a strong line of defense against uh, the psychological problems that now disturb us most persons who are in trouble today psychologically, morally, ethically and we might say culturally are persons of inadequate background they may have come from wealthy backgrounds they may have been well educated but they were not taught and inspired to respect honor, integrity and value nor, nor were they given a deep faith in any principle or power superior to their own desires in other words their spiritual culture was neglected they then come in middle life to an analyst having built a false life a life in which they have achieved a certain amount of haphazard success and this success well interlarded with misery reverse and disillusionment these people because they are now in a crisis seek to be straightened out but for 40, 50 or maybe 60 years these persons have never imposed any control upon themselves they have never accepted the sovereignty of anything superior to their own desires attitudes, opinions, and feelings. These persons, whenever they wanted to be angry, they were angry by divine right. Whenever they wanted to be stubborn, they were stubborn. Their virtues were never deep enough to prevent them from making the basic mistakes that have disfigured their lives. No psychotherapy can help these people unless it can re-educate them. And to re-educate them means that they must gain the skill and the strength to impose some regimentation of value upon their own lives. This has been one of the secrets of Alcoholics Anonymous. It has required a certain acceptance of the fact of God of the presence of a spiritual power that will help man if man will help himself and it is the acceptance of this superior power that has been the strength of this movement everywhere acceptance means the renunciation of self and self purpose in the acceptance of that which is superior and in our present uh, problem this acceptance applies the person coming under the discipline of a power stronger than himself the moment egoism which is self-centeredness uh, is brought under subjugation to something above egoism 
the moment the right to do as we please is subordinate to the conviction that it is our duty to please to do that which is right, that we are accountable for our conduct. The moment we begin to think this way, we are in a position to begin to discipline our own attitudes. When temper arises, we can simply say, this is contrary to my code of right. This code is more important than I am. This code is more important because it is revealed by God. It is supported by natural law. And I know that if I break this code, I will suffer. With such inducements, the person will make a little better effort to keep his code. He will feel also that there is a certain support for him in the keeping of his code. He will learn, as all wise people have learned, that nature makes it easiest for those who do decide to keep the code. If man, therefore, tries to do exactly as he desires, he may gain no support from nature and find nature actually against him. But if, on the other hand, he obeys the principles which he regards to be right, and he is right, then the whole strength of universal right is on his side. Nature wants him to be normal. Nature has decided what normal is. Nature declares that virtue is normal, health is normal, wisdom is normal, friendship is normal. These are the normal things. And the individual who lines himself with these normal things has the full support of nature. It will cooperate with him. It will advance him to the degree that he advances these principles through his own conduct. Words mean nothing. They must be supported by conduct. So, if we like to say, as a very devout person, uh, that if we ask God's help, and we are sincere, this help will be available. We are simply saying in another way, that if we are actually dedicated to right, this right everywhere in the universe is available to us as strength. And when we ask in the name of right for its protection and help, we are asking no more than is automatically ours anyway. But perhaps through the asking we gain a certain further sense of security. We are not asking intercession. We are trying to clarify the fact that if we obey the rules, the rules will protect us. But we have to subjugate our own will to the rules. The story of the fall of Lucifer is the story of self-will and its disaster. It is a legend to be found in some form throughout the whole world. The idea of man doing it his way in a divine world and coming to trouble. Acceptance brings us back again to the acknowledgement of the universal way and permits us to bend our knee in humility and yet in dignity to a plan that is so great that there is no dishonor in obeying it, only honor that this plan is something which does not enslave us, but makes us free men. And it is this plan that does not weaken us by making us obey, but rather strengthens us through the acceptance of proper obediences. There is therefore every possible inducement in nature to unite uh, all scientific knowledge available to us with this simple religious discipline, which if we receive it into ourselves at any age,
transfers leadership from the ego, from the personal self, from the center of selfness in our own natures, transfers our leadership from this center to a universal center. So that instead of following our own opinions into chaos, we follow the will of the universe along the path of eternal growth and light. When we make peace with the infinite, uh, we achieve serenity of spirit. And if we have peace with the infinite, at what can we be at war? There is no other power that is real. So in this type of thinking, we, we recognize strong acceptances. The acceptances of brave people who bend the knee to truth, who will allow no tyrant to rule our lives, that will fall under no tyranny, but will accept without question the leadership of truth itself. For if it is true that brave men are born leaders, it is also true that all brave men are born followers of truth. For it is truth that gives them bravery. It is the truth of principle that gives true courage. And actually, as the knights of old did their vigils in the cathedrals, dedicating their swords and their helms to the service of God, so modern man in all of his adventurings in this complicated world, he may be a leader over other men, but he does not deserve to be a leader until he is a follower of principles. The individual who does not take orders from the universe has no right to give orders to other men. And to recognize this relationship, we have to establish the acceptances built upon thoughtfulness, upon quietude, upon integrities, upon values, and upon peace of soul. So in the quietude of vigil, before the altar of the great cathedral, or before the matchless altar of our own soul, the individual must make his dedications. And once he has made his dedications and has loyally resolved to keep them, his life is secure. And he will remain under the protection of his own dedications. They will never fail him. He may fail them. But these truths and principles, once made part of consciousness, will protect us not only in this world, but in the infinite future that lies beyond. We have to accept birth into this world. We have to accept life here. We have to accept death when the hour comes. And we live in the full realization that we will accept the future, that we will accept immortality, the divine plan, whatever it may be, and through acceptance, will move with truth to its own ends. When we get a real sincere feeling about this, when we become truly dedicated quietly within ourselves, I do not think we will have near so many troubles. I do not think problems will seem nearly so great. And I don't think it will be so hard for us to be kind and just and thoughtful. All of these good things of our temperaments and dispositions arise from the simple acceptances which we make inside and a clear, firm, quiet dedication to truth in which we place our hope, our faith, and to which we dedicate our minds and our hearts and our hands. With these rather simple patterns, I think our neurotic problems will decrease. We will not need so much artificial help because we will have the continuing help of nature which will always support us while we are keeping the rules. 
Well, I think our time is up.